So please help me welcome to the stage our moderator, Jacqueline Smith, Senior Vice President, ASU Foundation for the New American University, Matt Dalio, founder of Endless, and of course, President Crow, President Arizona State University. Come on out. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. That was some fantastic singing. We so enjoyed it. Uh, I just wondered how many cooties there were out there. <laughs> So in addition to the singing and the hugging, GSV and ASU every year come together for a summit that's really known for creating opportunities for like-minded, entrepreneurial, impact-oriented leaders to come together and catalyze new partnerships. Matt, Michael, you are great examples of this since you met just two years ago at ASU GSV. And after a lot of hard work, today you'll be unpacking a fantastic new collaboration that we'll be talking about a bit today. But before we dive into that, we want to understand a little bit about what makes you tick. You both have a very futuristic mindset, and we want to hear a little bit about when you first realized that technology was going to play a transformative role in our education systems. Matt, we'll start with you. So I think there were um, two, two big insights, um, two big aha moments. The first was um, I was on a trip to India. I was at Stanford Business School at the time in the heart of technology. Um, and then I realized, this was 2010, that um, there was no one with smartphones and that that gap was going to be bridged and all of a sudden billions of people would have access to smartphones and with it the internet and with it educational opportunities. Um, and so I've spent the better part of a decade working on um, bridging device and internet access in emerging markets, um, which led me to really the insight that, that, that has led me to this stage, which is every time we would put games in front of the kids, um, they would like just emerge. You, you, I'd walk into classrooms with kids shouting numbers at each other, multiplication tables, because there was a math game in front of them. And so this first insight of like, wow, like if you want to go to places um, like Guatemala, where 70% of the math teachers cannot pass the math exam that they are teaching to, and you want to figure out how to break that generational cycle to teach the next generation, think about games. Um, the second insight was um, a, a more unexpected insight. And it was in every job interview um, that I would do with an engineer, I would ask the same question, which is how did you learn to code? And almost all of them answered the same thing. It was the same way Elon Musk learned to code, it was the same way Mark Zuckerberg learned to code, the head of Google AI. And it was, as a kid, I loved games. And then I discovered I could hack my games. And when I discovered I could hack my games, it was more fun to hack them than it was to play them, and that sent me on my journey. And so it was just this like staring me in the face of like, how do you teach youth everything from multiplication tables to how to go have a job in software? And how do you do that in a way that is scalable enough that hundreds of millions of kids could get educated. Well, hundreds of millions of kids are playing Minecraft, which ultimately is a creation experience. Hundreds of millions of kids are playing Fortnite, and with Fortnite Creative, it's having a resurgence because of its creation experience. Roblox is a UGC engine. The notion of using the act of creation in games, the thing that youth want to do, as the mechanism to teach them the skills that will ultimately give them jobs, whether it's a designer, an artist, an engineer, a project manager, the marketer. Like, if you can lean into the instinct that is already there in my two-year-old son playing with Legos, or in a kid playing Minecraft, or a kid who's building a video game in Unity, if you can lean into that instinct, we believe that you can teach youth like, en, en masse in a way that has never been possible before. That's so powerful. Michael, how about for you? Yeah, mine's probably a little weirder. So, so um, like over 50 years ago, a bunch of my friends and I would uh, play for 72 to 96 hour sessions, really complicated strategy and tactics games on, uh, with counters, little uh, squares on uh, boards with hexagons uh, with, in some of the games cases, over a thousand hexagons with strategy games simulating strategy and tactics in historical battles. And we would start Friday night after football uh, got back from the football game and then play sometimes until uh, we had to go to school on Monday morning or even later if we missed school on Monday to keep playing the game. Had to get there in time for football practice. And so, and so those games were unbelievably complicated, the most powerful learning things that you could possibly imagine on all things, on strategy, on tactics, on calculation, on economics, on resource allocation, all these kinds of things. It wasn't just a game about some historical thing. And then fast forward, 
to the early generations of those games on computers. Uh, and I thought, this is unbelievable. If you could find a way to computationally create these learning environments. And then, and then in 2008, with my then youngest child, who was eight years old, uh, our, uh, I was playing a game with her called Spore. Uh, and I got, she and I were in a contest. And in the Spore game, and it probably meant most people didn't play Spore. Who played Spore? So it was an unbelievable game. I probably played it 1,000 hours because you have to win the game. And it took 1,000 hours to win the game. So you can play the game on an airplane. And in the game, you start as a microorganism. And then you evolve through a series of decisions that you make. You then go through a biological evolution. And then you become a creature. Every creature is unique. You then build a sociology. You build technology. You make choices. You eventually become a planetary creature. You then eventually become an interplanetary species if you can then play the game in the right way. And then you're competing in this computer simulation against other civilizations to see if you can win. So I took that game apart. They never mentioned the word economics, but you learn supply and demand. You learn the allocation of resources. You learn everything there is about scarcity and decisions made under scarcity. The study of economics is the study of the scarcity of resources and their allocation. Political science is the study of power and its allocation. You learn, so then you're building treaties with these other, organizations, these other competing entities. So you learn economics, political science, evolution, biology, uh, and then you learn diplomacy because you're now trying to build treaties in multiple languages across multiple creatures that you don't even understand. And so what you realize is that we haven't figured out how to make learning about these really complicated things as interesting as we could. And I realized from those experiences that once you could get game-based learning to a higher level, you could throw off the shackles that the way that you learn about diplomacy is to read a book about diplomacy. I don't think so. That's one of the ways to learn about diplomacy. You could also learn about diplomacy by doing it, by then affecting an outcome. And so those are my two sort of two parts of my experience on game-based learning. You could see why I'm so excited to partner with ASU. <laughs> <laughs> you should have been in those. We, we literally would play those games for 72 hours, and you just sleep for like an hour or two while the other kid is doing their turn. And, and then uh, the penalty for cheating was quite severe. So. <laughs> So I'm hearing themes about making sure the learners have agency, that they're learning in an applied way, in a way that's exciting for them. That relates, I think, Michael, to how you have conceptualized this idea of ASU having learning realms, different ways and modalities in which uh, students and learners at ASU can advance. Can you explain a little more about the learning realms and Realm yeah. 5 in particular? So Realm 1, think of Plato and his students at the little building, the gymnasium, somewhere in a suburb of Athens called Academia of All Things, which really doesn't mean anything. The whole word academia is just the name of some farm town near Athens. And so, and so, uh, and so that was basically the, the method of face-to-face -face teaching back and forth, you know, full immersion with the professor. And almost all of education is built around that model. What we've now come to realize is that if you add some technology, now you can get digital immersion. You can get digital immersion in wide scale. You can do what we're doing in what we call Realm 4, which is education through exploration. If you haven't gone to the Dreamscape Learn facility that's here at the conference, uh, you should do that because that's a Realm 4 articulation of learning complicated things by becoming an actual object in the learning process. Uh, you're not learning science by looking at a Bunsen burner. You're learning science by being a scientist uh, in a way that, that really stimulates your outcome. And then Realm 5 for us is this notion of computationally we now have the systems and the tools and the methods to create individual learning pathways for individual humans, every single one, one is, which is different. We call this infinite, infinitely scalable learning. Games are probably uh, uh, one of the two pathways to greatly enhance these learning outcomes. And so what you do is you create learning environments, uh, individual to the student, in which you're pursuing a whole series of learning outcomes, but the learning process itself is not being called learning. You're playing a game, and through playing the game, you learn whatever it is that the game is going to teach you about how to win the game, or participate in the game, or, or observe the game. But then you're also learning, built into the game, or built into the tool, everything else that you need to know to be an effective, high-speed, lifelong learner. So that's what we mean by Realm 5, in terms of infinitely scalable learning. The, the way I often describe it is um, I was lucky to go to Harvard, an institution that prides itself in l how low its acceptance rate is. In other words, how many people can we reject and we can be proud about that. ASU's philosophy is how many people can we educate? Isn't that our mission? 
Um, and it's just such a different way of looking at the world, but it changes everything. Well, just related to that, I saw, I saw this uh, guy giving a talk the other day where he was saying, well, in universities, you measure your success based on how many people you don't admit. Imagine a hospital that did that, <laughs> that, that had all this fantastic technology and unbelievable doctors and unbelievable ways of doing things. So uh, an organization like our partner, the Mayo Clinic, they have two million patients. They don't pride themselves on having 20 patients, two million patients, to which they apply the best doctors, the best tools, the best nurses, the best scientists, the best everything. And so, so how does one build a system that allows learning to be expanded rather than to be kept bespoke as the dominant realm? There's nothing wrong with those kinds of schools or honors colleges and things like that. It's just that's wrong if that's the aspirational goal because that doesn't get society to where we need to be. So Matt, take us back two years ago. You're just starting to meet Michael. You're thinking through Realm 5 learning and gaming. Were you thinking about particular disciplines like STEM that might really benefit from this collaboration? Or what were some of your hunches about what might come together with a collaboration with ASU? So honestly, I, I walked into that meeting, you know, hear, hearing, having heard a lot about ASU, our, our partners um, started actually a, a program um, at ASU, and so I'd heard wonderful things about it. But I didn't realize who I would be meeting and just how aligned it would be. I mean, we, we were talking about the same books, the Foundation series and Ender's Game and, you know, the Diamond Age. And, and like, Those are all cool if you haven't read them. Great books that have formed both of our understanding of, of how uh, technology can educate and in particular games can educate. And so um, as we came out of that meeting, it was clear we needed to do more meetings. Um, we happen to have a team in, in Phoenix, and so it made it very easy to continue those conversations. And since then, over the past two years, um, we've evolved um, to, to something that we're excited to announce in, in a few minutes, but um, really a partnership that allows us to look at how you use the act of playing to teach and how you use the act of making to also learn um, and how you infuse all of that with AI in this very exciting moment of AI. So in Ender's Game, by the way, so humanity is about to be wiped out by an alien species and it's learned that only certain kinds of brains can uh, learn through a gaming mechanism how to defend the species, our species, against this alien. And so it turns out that in this game-based environment, these humans can learn things that no one else has ever been able to learn before, including the evolution of their own thinking processes and how they think and how they engage. And there's some, there's some you know, very complex socio-cultural elements to the game about about uh, visibility and honesty and so forth and so on. But nonetheless, this, if you just dissect these things down to the learning outcomes, it turns out an uh, 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 honorary PhD recipient at ASU uh, named John Seeley Brown, uh, he and some of his colleagues looked at uh, Masters of Warcraft uh, as a game, but they didn't study the game or who won the game. They studied what did you learn in the game, the rates of learning, the mechanisms of learning, the speed of learning, the self-learning, self organizing mechanisms for learning, the formation of learning guilds, which is what universities were built around, they, they found and concluded that it was the highest rate of learning environment that they'd ever seen in anything, ever. Anything ever calculated. So we've been teasing that uh, we have an announcement to make today. So Matt, what are Endless and ASU proud to announce this morning? So we're um, announcing the Endless um, Games and Learning Lab um, and a $5 million donation to catalyze that. Um, and the idea really is to look at how games can teach because, you know, you speak to every kid and games are central to everything they do. Um, and you speak to teachers and they know that kids want to use games and play games and so many of them want to um, use games in the classroom. Um, and so kind of pillar number one is how can games be used to teach both in and outside of the classroom. There are a lot of reasons why most learning games, quite frankly, are just are, are broken, right? Games have not been used to teach, um, um, you know, back in the Math Blaster days, like it, the quality of those games, you go to a Math Blaster and then you look at, you know, what they're playing with Fortnite and there's just such a discrepancy across so many levels. And yet you hear about games like this, where like the ones 
Dr. Crow has mentioned, but also like some of the most successful games in history are actually incredibly educational engines. SimCity teaching you about complex systems and urban planning, Civilization teaching you about history and diplomacy. Um, it, it, um, someone I was just speaking with a manager um, of a game studio who was describing she was you know, excellent at World of Warcraft and would re, uh, lead raids of 40 people and she's like my management instincts that I was learning as a high schooler are now the reason I am an effective manager today. And so there are so many games, ironically, that weren't even trying to achieve educational objectives that achieved educational objectives. And so, and then yet the games that are built for education have such a gap between those games and the ones that have been built. And so I think pillar number one is really to look at like how do you bridge that gap and to look at it from both the perspectives, I guess the, the, the trifold perspectives of the craft of game making. Really, because you know, it, is, it is an art to make games. And so let's look at it with the same level of art that someone who's trying to build the next Fortnite looks at it. From the entrepreneurial perspective, in other words, how do you actually build a successful business model that engages this to, to sweep the world at the sort of scale that we see with a $200 billion you know, market of, of gaming? It's twice the size of, uh, of, of the movie and music industry combined. How do you use that economic engine to move forward games and learning? And then third, the academic perspective, which is what is the research behind it? What is the science behind it? And how do you get those three um, disciplines to collaborate? So that's the, the first pillar is the, the act of playing. The, the second pillar that is, um, um, took us as Endless Studios a while to like wrap our heads around the power of is the act of making games. The act of producing a piece of software called a video game teaches you how to produce software of all kinds. Again, across the disciplines of design, art, engineering, music. management, marketing, music. music, all of storytelling, narrative, these like branching skill trees that extend into so many different real domains. Right? Like when you think, you know, art, oftentimes people think fluffy. Art is 3D modeling. 3D modeling is architecture, industrial design, mechanical engineering. These are real hard skills, real jobs. And so when you look at the, du the duality of make to learn as well as play to learn, and by the way, the participants and students who are making games can be building the very same games that can then be used to play, to learn. So those two things are actually very symbiotic. And then we were talking about, um, you know, just r r right back here, something that, you know, obviously everyone in this room is, is, is enthusiastic about, which is the power of AI, not as a discipline, but as infused in everything. Like, it is touching every single domain. And I was talking about, um, I, I, I wish I could have been a musician, a rock star in another life, and I never learned the instruments because it's, it's in me. My grandfather was a jazz musician, and yet I don't have the instruments. And this weekend I was just learning about... Um, a, a new thing that came out where you can literally hum or sing what you want and turn it into any instrument you want, guitar, violin, whatever the instrument. And that, and that means all of a sudden I can make music. And that same principle of AI lowering the threshold for people to be able to be the engineer on a team or be the artist on a team or to have someone to collaborate on storytelling with in ways that wouldn't have been possible for them before. Like AI infused in both the game learning, the, the game play and the game making is just almost price of entry in, these, in this day, day and age. Well, well here, here's, here's two examples of that, just to give you some learning sense. So one of the games that you mentioned was SimCity, a parallel game to that was Sim Earth. I played a lot of Sim Earth just to understand the complexity of Earth systems. It gives you basically, you know, some general understanding, but, but the way that I would play the game, so let's take a concept like albedo. So albedo is the reflectivity of the surface of the Earth to the photons of the sun arriving. And the albedo index gives you some sense of how much of the energy being delivered by the sun is then reflected back into the atmosphere or reflected back out of the atmosphere. And you can play around with it and learn it. Now today, with an AI tool while you're playing Sim Earth or a game like that, you'd just be talking to your AI. Well, give me some understanding of albedo. Give me some understanding of what it means. Give me some idea of how the Earth worked when it was all covered with ice or when it was 50% ice or no ice or this or this or this. And then, and then you could be learning in that. And so, so much so that, that, you know, I used to sort of build my own little pretend AI system, which was this series of computational tools that I would have while I would play the game. Now in our Dreamscape Learn 
uh, uh, biology laboratory, we're now building an AI tool that can then work with the student who's in the, in the virtual reality environment within the confines of that course to find ways then to just interact and enhance their learning in every possible way. The second we get that, this can be you know, in, in subjects like uh, science and English and literature and history, everything imaginable. The second we bring those two things together, learning will speed, learning will become more in-depth, learning will become more capable of being well understood. We think that there's a way to enhance learning outcomes tremendously. Now, it doesn't mean that no one's ever going to read a, a book again. So people that say these things, they're like, they're like clueless. So, so, so right now, how many of you are, are reading books sometimes? How many of you are listening to books sometimes? How many of you are watching things on uh, a streaming service? Uh, how many of you are still watching linear television? <laughs> and, so, and, I'm, and so I'm watching all of those things. So what, what, what's going to happen is that all of those things will become blended and combined and linked together in some kind of new way. And this gaming uh, uh, focus uh, will then allow us to greatly intensify learning, particularly in those subjects that are the most abstract or those subjects that are the most technically complicated because there's the way that we've been teaching them do not afford general understandability across enough of a broad cross-section of a learning audience. And so all these things are going to help us to break down all these barriers that have allowed us to end up with a highly stratified set of learning outcomes. Like, you're, like, they pay, like, like, like STEM subjects are called hard, hard science. Well, they're called hard for two reasons, because they're quantitatively based and because most people can't understand them. Uh, and so this is a way, I think, to break that all down. The, the other interesting thing about AI is that AI can be used as a tool to teach, but it is also essential that we teach people to use AI as a tool. Because the jobs of the future are all going to be shaped by it, every single one of them. And schools are so often like banning ChatGPT. The answer is like, you know, let's, let's protect them, hide from it. But the world doesn't judge us by the inputs by whether we wrote something, it judges us by the outcomes. Like, did we achieve our goals? And so when you teach youth to use AI as a tool to create bigger and better things than they could have created on their own, like that's the way the world will judge them. And so examples like that of AI being used as a tool to teach and then the process of building a game collaboratively across disciplines where you are using as a, it as a tool to create, like just so powerful. So I want to make sure we take an opportunity to celebrate the hard work that has gone in uh, from the Endless teams and the ASU teams. So let's give it up for a round of applause for the Endless Games and Learning Lab that will be launched. Thank you for your generous donation. This is all so exciting. Do you want to speak a bit about um, the kind of characteristics you're looking for in the founding director? So that's one of the next big steps. We'll be finding a founding director for this learning lab. And we have a brain scan tool scanning each of your brains right now. <laughs> <laughs> because we think the director might be in here. But go ahead. I, I'd actually love to hear your perspective on it. Well, I mean, you have to find a person who is uh, capable of understanding you know, what we're talking about here, has deep experience in all of this, but is also supremely uh, 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 aware of the learning outcome, what you were just saying, Matt, earlier. It's not, about, it's not even about the game. It's not even about the gaming process. It's not about building the game or teaching through the game. It is, do you have the capability of building the tools, the systems, the devices, and the measurements to, to basically show that you've produced a superior learner with a superior learning base with a driven learning capability that's never been producible before. And you have to have a person who understands gaming and gaming technology and gaming systems, but also understands all of that. Uh, and there's not very many people walking around that probably have those things combined into a single person. So we've got to find that person. Yeah, I think great answer. And, and I'll add one, which is just someone who sees, like the, shares the passion of the frontier that we are sitting at right now. 
Um, there, there, the other two books that, um, that we were, were talking about, one is the Foundation series, and basically, long story short in that is there's a 30,000 year arc, and this person sees that there's gonna be 30,000 years of war unless they do this thing, and they set up the Foundation to make a 1,000 years of war. And I, I'm gonna say this, because I, I believe it, that like we face either like the best version of humanity or the worst version of humanity. Like I was with Bill Gates a few days ago asking him like which one is it, and like, He's like, I don't want to be Cassandra, but dot, 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 read this book, The Coming Wave, because it shows how scary it is. And I believe that like the difference between good and bad is do we train the next generation, A, to have jobs in that world, and B, to solve all the other problems. And it will be these skills. It will be the skills of software, of AI, of technology, in a world where Satya Nadella says that every company is a software company. It will be those skills behind that that determine that future and I believe literally the future of the world and I believe that games as Michael was saying it's like one of two tools that we have to be able to educate en masse an entire generation of youth and so someone who shares that ethos I think is central and the second uh, one a book I'll, I'll say is I think you all should read it not because it's a great book but because inside of it is this thing, it's called the Diamond Age, and inside of it is a book called The Illustrated Primer. And the Illustrated Primer is this like highly dynamic, like when you say what is the future of the textbook, it's that. Um, it was written by the same author who, who coined the term the metaverse, which I'm not gonna go into my thoughts on the metaverse, but the book everyone should have been reading was The Diamond Age, because I believe that's the future of education. So that book written by Neil Stevenson, and that book called The Primer, we just uh, sort of soft, announce, I don't know if Mark Knopfel's in here, the new company Primer, which is built on designing and building that science fiction based tool, which enhances uh, learning in every possible way. And the first book, The Foundation Trilogy by Asimov, the character is Harry Seldon, H-A-R-I, it's a, it's a weird way to spell the name, but, but that particular character has built this conceptual place in which all knowledge is held in a single place, which has to be then sent to the edge of the, of the galaxy to be hidden and so forth and so on. But the point in all of these things is that the key to all of these futures is how do we enhance, expand, and personalize learning so that no human is left behind because of some social construct or some economic uh, 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 random outcome or, or what have you. How do you take this supercomputer the most complicated object in the known universe, the human mind, and how do you empower it in every possible way? So the young lady's primer or primer, uh, that device allows every individual to learn in a certain way. We now have the capability to build those things. We never had the capability to build these things before. How do we make these things work? And this, this effort helps us do all that. Well, the possibilities are endless, uh, but our time is not. So thank you so much this morning. It's been so fun to make this announcement. Cheers. Cheers.